All right, good morning, Council. Back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, Mr. Simpson is again present with his Council, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Douglas, Mr. Bailey, people represented by Ms. Clark and Mr. Darden. The jury is not present. Uh, Council, just a couple of things before we uh, begin. Uh, the record should reflect that I have received from the defense a 1335 motion, which we will deem, be deemed filed as of today, Mrs. Robertson. And Mr. Cochran, any other comments before we resume with the jury? Uh, yes, Your Honor. If I might approach the podium. The court, uh, I believe, received a copy of uh, of a letter that was sent to my office last night from Mark Partridge, the lawyer uh, who was on the plane from Chicago to uh, Los Angeles and sat next to Mr. Simpson. I would like, because I think it's relevant, to read this uh, letter into the record, if I might. The letter, Your Honor, is dated January 30th, 1995, sent to the law offices of Johnny L. Cochran, Jr. Your Honor, may, may I object? The letter speaks for itself. Counsel can simply file it with the clerk and make it a part of the record. Oh, well. And it was attention, Pat McKenna, Your Honor, one of the investigators. Dear Pat, I was surprised to learn today that I am one of the witnesses the prosecution claims was not previously disclosed. On the Friday, Mr. Simpson was arrested. I called the LAPD to identify myself as the person who sat next to him on his return flight from Chicago to Los Angeles. I believe I spoke to a homicide detective. I was told they knew who was on the flight and would get to me later. He did not ask for my address or phone number. On October 6, 1994, Richard Crotsley, C-R-O-T-S-L-Y, an LAPD detective called me. He said he had received a witness statement about me from the defense. I told him my story. He told me to send my notes. He gave me the following address. Los Angeles Police Department, Robbery Homicide Division, room 321, 150 North Los Angeles Street, Los Angeles, California, 90012. I sent my notes, Perrin, the same notes I sent you, Perrin, to Officer Crotsley in early December 1994. These facts seem inconsistent with my understanding of the prosecution's claims about undisclosed witnesses or witness statements. I thought I should bring this to your attention in case it is relevant to the procedure in the case. I also want you to know that I am scheduled to begin a three to four week trial in Chicago on June 5th, 1995, and would not be available to testify during that time. I'm away from my office until Wednesday, February 1st, but can be reached at, and he gave his phone number, sincerely, Mark Partridge. I want to read that for the record, Your Honor. Thank you. For the record, also, Your Honor, we have not received any such thing. Okay. Uh, no. All right, well, the, the real issue, I, I think perhaps uh, Mr. Partridge misunderstands the issue. The issue was, was the July 1994 statement that he gave to the defense turned over to the prosecution. That's the issue. Yeah, we think it was, right? Yeah. Certainly no. We think it was. All right. Uh, counsel, let me ask you one other question before we uh, start with the uh, jury. During the course of our um, discussion of expert witnesses now designated by the defense, if you recall, there's a possibility that one of our jurors uh, has as one of her physicians one of the doctors um, that is now on the defense witness list. So uh, I want you to contemplate the ramifications of that and we'll discuss it tomorrow. We have your we'll be ready to discuss that whenever you want. All right. Just so the ground rules are clear, uh, counsel, I'm going to uh, advise the jury that I've allowed the prosecution a brief reopening of their opening statement to deal with three specific issues and that there is an absolute time limit of 10 minutes. All right, any other comment? All right, let's proceed. Thank Deputy Mayor. Yes. Yes. yes.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. With the reporter, please. All right, thank you, Council. Uh, let me give a direction to the uh, still photographers here in the courtroom. Uh, gentlemen, you are not to take any photographs of any of the computer screens that are on the Council's desk or in the back row here. Understood? All right, and Ms. Hazlett, would you make sure that any other photographers who come into the courtroom are so advised? All right, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The court has granted a prosecution request to reopen their opening statement to address defense counsel's comments in his opening statement regarding three witnesses who had not previously been disclosed or whose statements had not been previously disclosed to the prosecution before trial as is required by the law. You are reminded, however, that any statements by the attorneys in this case are not evidence and should not be considered by you as such. Uh, Ms. Clark, you have 10 minutes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Cochran made some comments about a, first of all, I'm going to talk about a videotape. It has outtakes of the defendant making an exercise video. The defendant, and Mr. Cochran made some comments to you about the defendant's alleged arthritic condition. According to him, uh, the defendant's arthritic condition became acute sometime after he played golf and after he'd been swinging the golf club on the evening of June the 12th at about 10 p.m. He said at some point after that, the arthritic condition became acute. Mr. Cochran told you that the defendant's uh, physical capabilities are very limited as a result of that condition. The prosecution will show you evidence to the contrary. We will show you outtakes of an exercise videotape which was made by the defendant only two weeks before the murders. We will show you a portion of that videotape to demonstrate just what the defendant's physical capabilities really were on the evening of June the 12th, 1994. In it, you'll see the defendant just two weeks before the murders that he weighed 212 pounds, which is what he weighed 15 years ago. That the defendant prided himself in that tape on being in good physical condition. You will see him doing push-ups. You will see him lifting his arms overhead. You will see him stretching, reaching, throwing jabs and uppercuts, and he does that for several minutes in this tape. You'll see him doing trunk twists, and this tape took hours to make. And then he came back after that day, went back the next day, and spent a lot more time doing that very same thing. We're gonna show you that tape during the course of this trial. Second of all, counsel made reference to the fact that, to statement that uh, Howard Weitzman, who was then the defendant's attorney, was not permitted to be present during the interview with the police officers on June the 13th. And you were told by counsel that they refused, that police officers actually refused to allow Mr. Weitzman to remain with the defendant during that interview. That is completely wrong. And in fact, what the evidence will show is that the detectives asked Mr. Weitzman to stay for the interview, but that he declined to do so, stating that he would prefer to go out to lunch. And that prior to that interview, he had had approximately half an hour alone with Mr. Simpson to talk to him, after which he said, go ahead, went out to lunch. And that is what the evidence will show. And that was after the detectives invited him to come in and sit during the interview with him. Now, lastly, you heard Mr. Cochran talk to you about a witness named Marianne Gurchis. Now, he told you about this witness. He said it was a very important witness. He discussed at some length what she would testify to, telling you that she claimed to have seen four men on the night of the murders, at least two of whom were Hispanic, so at least one or two of whom were wearing a knit cap, and that she, she saw them possibly running from the area of Nicole Simpson's condo on the night of the murders. 
Now, you'll be hearing a lot more about Ms. Gurchis during the course of this trial, but right now, I'm just going to address a few points that the evidence will show that Mr. Cochran didn't tell you about. For example, she spoke to her friend Sheila Carter the day after the murders of Ron and Nicole. She told her friend, Sheila Carter, that she was not even at Bundy on the night of the murders. Mary Ann Gurchis had planned to go and look for an apartment in Brentwood on the night of the murders on June the 12th. The next day, she spoke to Sheila Carter and said she did not go to Brentwood on that night, and she was glad because there had been murders committed there the night before. But Ms. Carter is also going to tell you something else. In addition to the fact that she will tell you that Ms. Gurchis told her she did not go to Brentwood on the night of the murders, she's also going to tell you something very important about Ms. Gurchis' credibility. She will tell you about a statement which proves that Ms. Gurchis is one of these people who comes out of the woodwork in high-profile cases so they can get involved. And here's what Ms. Carter will tell you. Ms. Gurchis was obsessed with this case, and she talked as if she knew the defendant personally. She said that Ms. Carter would send her to the store to buy every inquirer, every star, and every tabloid pertaining to this case, anything that talked about the Simpson case. She would read it all, and she would save it, and talk about the case constantly. But just she somehow never told anyone that she had been on Bundy on the night of the murders until the time that Robert Shapiro started the hotline requesting that anyone with information come forward and call that hotline number. And it was right around that time that he put out the hotline number that Mary Ann Gurchis started to say, well, maybe I was driving by that area. Maybe I did see something. Mr. Cochran accused us of not telling you about her, and we didn't, because we didn't know about her. And if you believe her, she asked the defense attorneys if they would tell us about her, and they said they would. She spoke to Robert Shapiro, and Shapiro's people told her not to talk to anyone about her statement. And when they finished taking her statement, they told her they weren't going to use her as a witness. They spent hours interviewing her back on July 10th and July 12th of 1994, and they never told us about her. Now, that jury instruction counsel showed you about credibility of witnesses applies to all witnesses, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence will show that Mary Ann Gurchis is a known liar and a Simpson case groupie. Thank you for keeping an open mind to listen to all of the evidence. Yes, please.
All right. Thank you, Council. Mr. Cochran, you had uh, a request? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, as we've previously indicated to the court, we will at this time ask leave of court to um, exclude all witnesses, save the investigating officers Lang and Van Adder, and save two investigators from the defense, Pat McKenna and Bill Pavlik, and ask and save the family, the exceptions regarding the family members um, uh, in this matter. We would ask the court to exclude all witnesses and admonish those witnesses regarding discussing their testimony and also regarding watching television of these proceedings, which would be the same thing as discussing the testimony. All right, any comment from the people? I said all witnesses, Your Honor. All right, so ordered. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Darden, Ms. Clark, are you ready to call your first witness? All right, call your first witness, please. And if you would, if you could, maybe we don't need all three chairs up there at the people's side this week. Perhaps we could get one, rid of one of the chairs and give you a little more working room over by the podium. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Which podium would you like us to do if it doesn't matter? Well, my preference at this point is your preference, Mr. Darden. You're the trial lawyer. Be my guest. Just, why don't you just move it over a couple of feet because I want to avoid our other problem if we can. Thank you. All right, Deputy Chex, can you help Ms. Clark get rid of this chair, please? Thank you. Mr. Darden, why don't you just slide those chairs over just a little. Who is your first witness? Sherry Gilbert, Your Honor. All right. As she approaches the witness stand, Your Honor, we have uh, here a uh, 911 audio tape. We like to market uh, People's One for identification. All right, People's One for identification. All right, Ms. Gilbert, would you step over here by the witness stand, please, by the court reporter? Mrs. Robertson. Please raise your right hand. <coughs> you solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth to hold truth and nothing but the truth to help you by. I do. Please be seated. The state will spell your first and last names for the record. My first name is Sharon, spelled S H A R Y N. Last name is Gilbert, G I L B E R T. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Gilbert. Good morning. Ms. Gilbert, who do you work for? Los Angeles Police Department. And what is your job title? I'm a police service representative. And are you also a 911 operator and dispatcher? Yes. Okay. And were you a 911 operator and dispatcher on January 1, 1989? Yes, I was. And were you on duty between 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning on that date? Yes, I was. And on that date <clears throat> and during that time period, did you receive a telephone call? Yes, I did. And where were you physically located at that time? Um, I believe I was sitting on Council 41. It's indicated on my incident, the, con the console that I was sitting on. Okay, so you're sitting at Console 41. Yes, which is a, what we determine as a primary position, and primary is 911. Okay. Now, is Console 41 located in a private office? No, it is not. Is it located in a cubicle? No, we don't sit in uh, individual cubicles. We, there are approximately five consoles side by side, uh, to all connected together. I take it that there's a telephone of some kind uh, uh, in front of you? Uh, each console has its own telephone, and it sits to the left of each operator. And are you uh, provided with earphones? Yes, we have headsets, individual headsets. Okay. And are you also provided with a keyboard? Yes, we have two computer screens and a keyboard for each console. Okay. If you will, take us 
through the process and procedure that occurs whenever you receive a 911 telephone call. Okay, the call comes in and you answer it, correct? Yes, um, when you're plugged in, you ha we have what you call an in button. It stays in all the time ready for a call to what you say drop in. And we have an, an indicator on the panel to the left that shows the address and phone number where this call is originating from. And it also comes in on my computer screen, which is the left computer screen considered as our status screen. Okay, so whenever you receive a 911 call, a display comes up on the console that indicates the origin of the telephone call? Yes. The address uh, from which the telephone call originated? Yes. And that same information comes up on another screen? Comes up on our status screen. You know, I have here a single page document. It appears to be uh, some form of a 911 dispatch. Uh, dispatcher's law. I provided Mr. Cochran with a copy. May it be marked People's 2. All right, People's 2 for identification. People's two for identification. Do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. We have one moment. Yeah. Uh, I also have a copy of the document on the Elmo machine. May we uh, project it on the screen, please? Yes. Certainly. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. <laughs> Ms. Gilbert, what is, what is the... Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Take it down. <laughs> what is the document uh, marked uh, People's Two for Identification? It's an incident form, what we determined to be an incident format. Okay. And how was that form created? Well, on my working screen, which is the screen to my right that's directly in front of me, we have a format that allows us to create an incident com by the computer by inserting certain commands. And I like to make a correction. I, it shows that I was on console 54. On the top line, it shows the time that I got the call. And the top, it, the, uh, top example here is my update, so I need to drop down to the bottom. It shows the top line, shows the call came in at 358. It has my operator number. It shows the console that I was on and the incident number created. Okay. Now, does the, does the form also provide a, a space for you to add comments? Yes, it does. And did you add some comments to that form in this situation? Yes, I did. Okay. It sh that's, that's where it shows in, uh, in a, a rule. It shows the update of, the, of my incident in the top example, and that was after I entered the comments. And you did add those comments to yes. this form. And the comments that you added to this form, were these comments based on your perception, your hearing? Yes, it was. Okay. May I, Your Honor? You may. 
on screen. Looking at the bottom one-third portion of the form, and I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Fairlow, can you uh, zoom in closer? Yes. Old world, same document. What time did you say you received the telephone call? 3.58. And 3.58 in the morning? Yes. <clears throat> and does the incident report indicate the origin of the telephone call? Um, no, it just shows I, I have the ability to update it, and I have the ability to update the incident type. When I first got the call, I had it as an unknown trouble. Okay. Okay, so the call came to you, right? Right. It was the open line. Okay. And could you hear anything over the open line? No. I, at, at the beginning, no. Okay. Did the line remain open? Yes, it did. And while the line was open, uh, at any point in time, could you hear anything? Yes, I did. And what did you hear? At first, I heard a, a female screaming. And that's when I went back and changed my incident type from unknown trouble to a screaming woman. And did you hear anything else? Yes, I did. And what did you hear? I heard I have someone being hit. You heard a noise that you associated with someone being hit? Yes. And what did you do with that information? That's when I went back and updated it to in the, in the fact that I heard a female screaming, and then I heard what I thought was a slap. I went back and updated it as a female being beaten at the location to give the responding officer an indication of what was going on, that it was no longer an unknown trouble. In fact, you indicated that a female being beaten at location could be heard over the telephone. Yes. Okay. What was the next thing that you did after you uh, updated the uh, incident? I um, brought up the necessary frequencies to broadcast it bureau-wide and for the air unit to assign a unit. And uh, did you uh, assign a unit? At the time I dispatched it, either there were any units available or I d did an immediate dispatch, and I just broadcast it to West L.A. units. And. Is there something called a call priority or a priority code in terms of dispatching units to, to certain types of incidents? Yes, it is. It's indicated to the right, far right, you see a C, C slash P and a 2 slash H. That means code too high. And for the police department, that means a hot shot. That means immediate response. You mentioned a moment ago that the, that the telephone line was left open, is that correct? Yes. Can you tell us how long that line was left open? Well, only can go by my incident that I created, that the call came in at 358, and I updated it at 401. So I, kept, I stayed on the line at least three to four minutes. Okay. So the line was open then, three to four minutes? Yes. And the screams that you heard, you say that those screams were the screams of a woman? It sounded like a female to me. It didn't sound like a man? No. Could you tell uh, who was being hit or struck or slapped? No, I could not. Oh, well, she indicated no, she couldn't tell. Interesting. Are 911 calls recorded by the other? Yes, they are. And have you listened to the uh, 911 call you received at 3.58 in the morning on January 1, 1989? Yes, I have. And when was the last time you listened to that uh, tape? Approximately a week and a half ago. And when you listened to the tape, a week and a half ago, 
could you hear slaps or, or strikes? Oh, you can answer the question. I could, in remembering the call, I could determine after the first screen that I heard someone being hit. Thank you. With the court's permission, Your Honor, I'd like to play the uh, 1989 911 tape. All right, you have that identified uh, as an people, exhibit. Yes, it's been marked people's one. All right. Ms. Gilbert, is that a uh, tape recording of the telephone call you received at 3.58 a.m. on January 1, 1980? Yes, it is. And there's more to the tape, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And when you listened to the tape last week, did you hear your voice on the tape? Yes, I did. You testified a moment ago that you dispatched your units to 360 North Rockingham? Yes. Okay. Is that on the tape? Yes, it is. Did you indicate that you that you dispatched the units to 360 North Rockingham Apartment B? Yes, it, it is indicated on there. Okay. Um, could you explain to us why you uh, included the Apartment B directly? When I first created the incident, I had not erased my screen prior from a prior call that I determined not to dispatch on and had not erased the apartment number out of the field. When I went back and hit enter on a computer, it erased everything but the correct location that came up on the A and I, okay. on the telephone console. Now we hear other voices, male voices, and apparently other dispatchers in this tape. Is that correct? Right. Those other voices, those male voices, those, those dispatchers, where is that noise originating from? From people sitting beside me. There's people that sit behind me. Also, I had brought up the frequency to broadcast the call, and you were hearing the other divisions that were on the air because it was an open line. As long as I had not hit my transmit button, then you will hear all that. In the comments you typed uh, onto the incident report, mark people's two for identification, uh, where you indicate that you could hear a female being beaten. Uh, at what point in this process did you type that information onto the report? After I, after I had made my incident and, and made it a screaming woman, and hearing is just, you get excited, you hear all of it at one time, and I went back and typed it in after that, after I had created the incident. Okay. And is this while the, the telephone line is open? Yes, I left it open. Okay. So it's during the telephone call then that you typed in the comment about uh, you're hearing a woman being beaten? Yes. Okay. Did the caller ever speak to you directly? No. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. 
Carcon. You can leave that out if you Good morning, Ms. Gilbert. Good morning. I'd like to ask you a few questions for Mike. The date of this incident was back in uh, 1989, was that correct? Yes. And that was January 1st? Yes. Was that um, January 1st, 1989 at about 3.58 in the morning? So that would be New Year's Day morning, is that correct? New Year's Day morning, yes. Right. As I understand what you've indicated to us, you received uh, this call through the open line, is that correct? Yes. And you were sitting at your console, and being 911, you started to to pay attention to that call, to listen to it. Then you did, made some reaction. Is that correct? Right. Now, from what you told Mr. Darden, you never had a.